Hey family, Pastor Torre, God bless you. Listen, this message that you're getting ready to hear is going to change your life. I want to remind you about another message. It's a message in my new book, Wholeness, Winning in Life from the Inside Out, that is going to be released on February 6th, but you can pre-order it now. I'm excited about that book. It's going to change your life. A lot of times the things that you are expecting or hoping for outside in life has to do with what's going on inside of your life. And so the book is amazing. It's incredible. You can pre-order it now at a discount, but for now, let's get into this message. God bless you. We're standing here because of that. You do realize that. That you're standing here, whether you know it or not, because of his grace, because of his goodness, because he's an amazing God. That's the kind of God that we serve. And if you don't serve him, you're welcome here, but you have the opportunity to connect with him in a way that you never have before and your life will never be the same because he makes all the difference. Yeah. Amen? Amen. 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 Man, it's, it's so good. I'm going to say this is my first time, but it feels so good to be home. Yeah. This feels like home. It feels like home. And uh, you guys are family, and you guys are, have treated me in, in such an amazing way, and uh, I love every single one of you, uh, even though some of you and some of your team are not Broncos fans. Uh, you guys have just started to get football teams. Uh, one of your security is walking around with a Chargers jacket. I'm like, they've only been here for a couple of months. How can you have that much loyalty? Um, but uh, we love you anyway. And uh, we're glad to be here. Bring you greetings from the Mile High City. And uh, Pastor Ture and, and First Lady Sarah, in the time that we've had to be connected to them and to know them, we've grown so much and, and our lives have been so enriched. And it's almost like when we met them, it's almost like you, you get that feeling like you've known this person for longer than you've actually known them because something in them connects with something in you and you realize that, that your destiny is tied to certain people. And uh, I don't know if this is your first time or if you've been here for years, but I encourage you to, to really dig into the fact that the Spirit of God on the inside of, of that couple has something for your life. And there's something for your life and your future that's tied to what God's placed on their life. Can we honor them? Can we celebrate them in their absence? We love you, PT. First Lady Sarah, you're amazing. We celebrate you. Honored to be in the house that God has built through you. Amen. Do you guys have your Bibles this morning? You guys read the Bible in LA? Go with me, go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Chapter 2. This is the official scripture to read the week after Christmas because this story that I'm going to read actually happened the week after Jesus' birth, eight days from the time that the Son of God came into the world. He was in a temple, and we're going to read about a man that was in the temple and what happened to this man, and, and I believe it can speak to your life. And um, Luke chapter 2, verse 25, I'm in the New Living Translation of the Bible, so if you have that, you can go to that, if not, it'll be on the screens for your reading pleasure. It says, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous. Somebody say righteous. righteous. And devout. Somebody say de devout. devout. And was eagerly waiting. Say eagerly waiting. eagerly waiting. I don't know what you're waiting for today. But God is so good. That the desires that he puts inside of you are not to taunt you. They're not to get your hopes up. Uh, I don't know how familiar or unfamiliar you are with church, but typically around the end of the year, preachers like myself tend to get on platforms like this on the last day of the year, and they encourage you with how great the next year is going to be, and they get all hyped up, and if they got an organ, the organ starts playing because the Bible says that, and, you know, and, and they get into it because we, we don't just do it to hype you up, but we do it because if God has you eagerly waiting for something, it's because he eagerly intends to make that happen and make it a reality in your life. So if you're eagerly waiting, hold on, because there's a God who's on his way. 
And he will not disappoint. It says he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He was where he had eagerly waited to be. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. Because this is not just for a couple few. This is not just for the chosen or the ones who've been around longer than you or the ones who know more than you or the ones who've had more experience than you. But this is for all people. And no matter who you are, no matter what your story is, no matter what your journey has been, God has a salvation for you that will revolutionize everything about you. And it says something about this salvation. It says he is a light to reveal God to the nations. And he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined, the original destiny's child. (laughs) Come on, somebody. When everybody else says no, 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 God is the one. (laughs) Don't get me started because I'm a survivor and I'm not going to give up and I'm not going to stop. It says this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. Somebody say rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. See, God wants everybody to rise. God doesn't just want some people to rise or the people that he likes or the people that, as if he only likes certain people when he created all of them. And he, if you're a father in here, if you're a parent in here, you don't, and you have multiple children, you don't have the luxury of saying, well, well, I, I, I love my firstborn, but like the others, you know, if their life doesn't go out that, if it doesn't happen that great, you know, I mean, it is what it is. No, 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 no. If, if he fathered you, he has intentionality behind the way he wants your life to go. And he wants you to rise. Make no mistake about it. Last verse, he says, and as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your very soul. He's talking to Mary, the mother of Jesus. It would break her heart to see people reject her son. Because she knows who her son is. She knows who Jesus is. She knows the love that he would have for people. And it would break her heart to see people reject him. And I pray that over the next few minutes that we're together this morning, that you would see in Jesus, like you've never seen before, a desire that he has for you to rise. And that's the title of the word that I believe God's given me this morning for you, is destined to rise. Because you're destined to rise. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that these are not my words. God, these are not the words of a man, but these are words inspired by God Almighty. When Luke was writing them, he was under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And God, and we believe that he was inspired to tell this story and that the inspiration in this story will inspire people this morning, God, whether in this room or watching by live stream around the world. God, we thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to us today through your word and that what you say to us, whenever you speak to us, whenever we can get close enough and calm the noise around us enough to hear your voice, your voice will always cause us to rise. God, and I thank you, God, that your voice is going to each and every heart and each and every situation, each and every story, each and every mindset, and it's causing them to rise. And we promise to give you all the praise for it, Lord, because you're the one who makes it happen. In Jesus' name, and somebody said, amen, amen, amen. You can be seated in the presence of God. And, you know, as we, as we talk at the end of the year, you know, oftentimes we, we think of where we are, you know, in relation to where we want it to be at the beginning of last year and when we were just as excited 
last New Year's Eve talking about the same things. And, and we think about 2018 or the next year and, and where we want to be. Um, but how many of you have ever had a destination in mind, but you were concerned, legitimately concerned about whether or not you were going to actually make it to that destination? Let me see your hand. It's just human nature. It is what it is. Life has a way of surprising you with things that make you think that you will not be able to overcome. And I remember a couple of months ago, um, I was going up to the city of Seattle for a conference, and I have some friends that live in Vancouver, Canada, which is about three hours away. And I told my brother, I said, let's, let's make a trip out of it. Let's, let's fly up to Seattle and, and drive up. And so I flew in on a Wednesday. The conference that I was going to was on Thursday. And then my brother flew in on Friday, and we made the three-hour drive in a rental car. And it took us two hours to get to the Canadian border. And right as we crossed the Canadian border, about uh, 30 minutes to 8 o'clock, when everything seems to close down in, in Vancouver, uh, or in Canada in general, it seems like everything shuts down a little earlier there. And uh, we were driving, and the, the low tire pressure light came on the car. And I don't know if you have any experience with low tire pressure lights, but I do. And uh, it's not a very pleasant experience to recall. I remember uh, a couple of months ago, or years ago, in, in Denver, um, we have this highway called I-70. And I know you guys call them the, the 5, the 405, the 110, the 101. We call them just I-70. That's what you're supposed to call it. So we just, we just call it like it is, you know? And so I was, I was driving on I-70, and I had had my tire light on for, for a couple of days because I was just running around doing all kinds of stuff, and I didn't get around to taking it to the tire shop to get it checked out. And I was like, I'll just fix it. And I was driving to this, this event, and I was going to do some stuff for them. And, um, and, and I'm driving, and I'm in the fast lane, and my tire explodes. And I end up, thank God, there's a shoulder next to the fast lane. So I pull over into that shoulder, and I spent two hours of my Saturday morning trying to call roadside assistance and get all this fixed. So I do not want to have this experience in a foreign country when I'm on vacation trying to enjoy myself. Okay? And so we, we find this, this place that was open still, and, and it was kind of shady, and we're like, I hope you know what you're doing, because, you know, we're not trying to spend our time stuck on the side of the road. And, and they put some air in our tires, and we, we kept going. And right about 8 o'clock, as this place had closed, and as all the other places that, I, places that I had looked up online closed, the light came back on. And I'm like, we might not make it to the place that we're trying to go. And thankfully, we made it all the way to the city of Vancouver. I told my friend, I was like, listen, I know we want to go downtown and check out some stuff, but I got to get this fixed because I don't want to end up stuck on the side of the road. And we went to another spot, and the technician came out, and he looked at it, and he made some adjustments. And he was like, really, the problem has already been fixed. The issue is already solved. What you need to do is reset the computer of the car so that it will align with the problem that's already been fixed. And I don't know what destination that you're trying to get to, but the thing that you're worried about that's going to stop you has already been fixed. You just need the computer of your mind, come on somebody, to be aligned with the word of God and to be aligned with what God has already done for you. And that's exactly what happened in the life of Simeon, the man that we read about, because he had a desire. He had a desire to see the Messiah. And it wasn't his desire. It was a desire that God had put in him because he began to connect himself to God. And I have a heart for people really understanding this and really seeing this because I don't know your story. Your story may be different from mine. Maybe you're new to the things of God or maybe you don't even know why you're in here this morning. But I grew up in church. And, and you hear of latchkey kids, I was a church key kid. And I grew up on the pews, and I grew up falling asleep in the pews and spent my entire life in church. And, and one of the things that I couldn't wrap my mind around when I was younger was how it was that people actually connected to God. And how it was that people actually, how it was that they actually had a relationship with him because I wanted to have that, and that was kind of the destination that I wanted, but I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get there. And one of the descriptions that it gives about Simeon is it says that he was righteous. And the thing about righteousness that you have to understand is that righteousness is not tied to your perfection. 
Righteousness is not tied to your ability to perform, but your righteousness is tied to God's ability to perform on your behalf. And 2,000 years ago, there was a man by the name of Jesus who gave his life. You've heard about him. You've seen him in movies. But he gave his life so that his life could take the place of the punishment that you deserved. And because of that, and only because of that, you can stand right before God. So in 2018, and as we finish out 2017, I want you to make the decision to disrupt disappointment by deciding to believe. Because if you decide to believe God, you can connect yourself to the righteousness of God, and the righteousness of God makes you stand before God as if you were Jesus himself. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He doesn't see your past. He sees through you because he sees his son in you. And that happens because you decide to believe. We're talking about being destined to rise, and being destined to rise is inextricably tied to the decisions that you make. And one of the decisions that you have to make is the decision to believe. Because it's, it's better than you've ever imagined. It's better than you've ever dreamed. What God has for you is beyond your wildest imagination, and it's only possible if you connect yourself to him in faith. And as you connect yourself to him in faith, you disrupt disappointment. Because as human beings, we're on a path towards being disappointed and being let down in life. But it's our faith that pulls us off that path and puts us on the path towards our destiny. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to dig into the Bible, not because of a religious obligation, not because it's a new year and it's the perfect time to start a new discipline, but because if you do it, your faith will grow. And if your faith grows, then you can find yourself on the path that God's designed for you to be on. The second thing that you need to do, besides disrupting disappointment, is God wants you to enter into this next year with the ability to dominate your decisions. He wants you to be able to dominate your decisions because typically we find ourselves dominated by our decisions. We find ourselves living under the weight of decisions that we made that if we could go back and turn the clock back, we would make different ones. And it's only natural. And oftentimes, the reason why we allow ourselves to be dominated by decisions is because we haven't yet disrupted disappointment. And we assume that, a, that disappointment is a part of the journey and it's a part of the process. And it's something that you just have to learn to live with. But if you can learn how to dominate your decisions, then disappointment will become a thing of the past. Because that's God's intention for disappointment. And the way that you dominate your decisions is by making the decision to decide what fills you. Because you can actually choose what fills you. And the importance of deciding what fills you is that what fills you will inevitably end up being what leads you. That's why the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you. And there's certain, there's certain destinies that are tied to certain decisions. God's destined you to rise. But the only way that you'll rise is if you decide right. If you decide right, your life will be drastically different than from what it would have been if you had it. And if you allow yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he will take you places that you've never even dreamed of. That's, it's the truth. And Simeon, the guy that we read about, he found himself in the right place at the right time for his desire to be fulfilled. Sometimes if, if, you, if you stop and you think about the desires that you have, if you think about the dreams that you have, maybe some of you have even started to write down goals or things that you want to accomplish coming into this next year, and you're, you're looking forward to them. And if you're, if you're really smart, what you'll do is not just stay within the realm of dreams that you can comp accomplish with your own strength and your own ability, but you'll start to write down dreams that scare you. You'll start to write down dreams that make you nervous. You'll start to write down dreams that make your knees knock because you're like, if, if God doesn't step in and if the Holy Spirit doesn't overshadow me, 
this is a pipe dream and it's never going to happen. And if I'm crazy enough to open up my mouth and tell somebody else about it, then I'm really going to look foolish because they're going to think that I think that it's actually possible. When in reality, it is possible if you allow the Spirit of God to fill you because the Spirit of God will empower you to not live in disappointment, but you'll dominate your decisions and it'll become a reality. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to decide what fills you. Because if you, if you live on the path that you were born on and if you live on the path that you've always been on, then you won't find yourself with the ability to dominate decisions and you'll think that it's just normal. The other thing that the Bible says about Simeon is apart from being righteous, it says that he was devout. Somebody say devotion. He was devoted. He was devoted to God. And when I was younger, I would look at people who I considered to be devoted to God and, and their devotion seemed like something very, very far away. And it seemed like something that I could never really attain to because I just wasn't desirous of that kind of devotion. But when you find out that you've been made righteous by God and it's a gift that he's given you, the ability to connect to him, the ability to receive his love, the ability to receive his purpose, the ability to receive his goodness, the ability to receive his forgiveness, that it's all a gift it's all a gift. Even, even the fact that he has a, a plan for you and it's, it's this grandiose plan, but that he's going to give you the, des the design and the ability and the talent and the skill to be able to accomplish that plan, all of that's a gift. And when you realize how big the gift that God has given you is, then all of a sudden devotion becomes natural. Yeah. Devotion is a byproduct of what God has already done for me. Devotion is not something that I manufacture to try and get him to love me more as if I could do something to make him love me more than he already does. And that, I believe, is going to be a revelation for somebody in this next year, is that there is nothing you can do today, tomorrow, or ever that will make God love you more than he already does. And if you can rest in that, then you can be filled with that. And if you're filled with that, then that will lead you to dominate your decisions. How many, um, how many iPhone users do we have in here? All right, Every, everyone else will we'll have an altar call at the end of the service. We'll pray for you. You'll be able to come down. God will touch you. The spirit of God will rebuke that spirit of Samsung, and you'll be set free in Jesus' name. Um, I, am a, I am an avid Apple everything fan, all Apple everything, and uh, I just love it. It's amazing. Very satisfied customer. And um, I, I also have an iPhone, of course, as you would imagine. And... Um, when, when the AirPods came out, the cordless headphones, I don't know if you've experienced this yet, but um, it's amazing. I highly recommend them if you have the opportunity to, to take advantage of that. And I remember when I got them, you know, everybody's concern was like, they're so small, and like, am I going to lose them? You know, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a devout, devoted person, right? And, and Apple has done so much for me, so I'm so devoted to them, you know? And so there's three things I always leave the house with, my phone, my wallet, and my AirPods. And matter of fact, I still got them in my pocket. And, um, and so the other day, I was, I was out doing something, and I'll put them in my ear, and if you've, if you've never used these, they're, they're very comfortable. They, they, you know, you run around, they're, they're not going to fall out. I'm not getting paid for this, but they're really good. <laughs> Um, so I, I put them in my ear, and you, you forget that they're there. And I went to uh, God's, one of God's favorite places, Chick-fil-A. And uh, come on, somebody. They have Chick-fil-A out here? Come on, Jesus. One L.A. and Chick-fil-A is all we need to change the world. Um, and so I, I went into, in, into Chick-fil-A, and I was getting something to eat. And usually I'll, like, work through through my lunch or whatever or whatever I'm doing and so I opened my computer and I was like man and I, and I opened my the little thing that the airpods come in and I, I opened the case up and and I looked and, and they weren't there and I was like <laughs> I lost them and I was like man and I'm trying to think like racking my brain like where did I go where was I who was I with? Was I in somebody's car? Did I leave him in the Uber? Like, what happened? And, and, and I was like, ah. Oh. And they brought my food out. And I wanted my headphones so I could, you know, listen to stuff on my computer and stuff. And I had to go, I had to go old school. And I had to, I had to pull out the old headphones. 
you know, it's like going back a blast to the past and, you know, just pulled them out. And I had to, I had to have a cord again. And, and I couldn't just walk around and be free like God has called me to be. I had to be, I had to be chained, you know. It's just, that's not the will of God for your life. And, and, and so I, I, I plugged them in to the computer. And I, I literally, I, I went to go put them in my ear. And they knocked against the, 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 the other ones. And I was like, I, I thought I had lost it. But, but it had been there all the time, you know. And, 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 and one of the things that you'll realize is if you allow yourself to be connected to the Spirit of God, God has put within you the ability to hear from God. And I don't care what you go through. I don't care what you find yourself struggling with. That ability to hear from God is there. And if you can hear from God, you will find yourself being able to rise to heights that you never thought were possible because God gave you that ability. Those headphones don't, those, those AirPods, they don't, they don't come in the packaging with the iPod. There's a price to pay for those things. That's why I was scared I lost them. But Jesus has paid the price for you to be able to hear from God. And to not be chained, to not be connected to where you can't be free and be who God has called you to be. But if you keep listening to his voice the way that he's designed for you to listen to it, you can move into the places that he designed for you to move into. God wants to fill you. God wants to fill you. And he wants to fill you with stuff that didn't come in the packaging that you were born with. He wants to fill you with stuff that didn't come in the packaging that your parents gave you. God loves your parents. Of course he loves your parents and you love your parents. But there were things that your parents weren't in a position to give you because your parents didn't create you. You may have come from them physically, but you were an idea that originated in heaven. And the God of heaven and earth has equipment for you to be able to accomplish the destiny that he's called you to accomplish. And he will make sure that you get all of that equipment. The only thing you have to do is to decide to be filled with it. To allow yourself to be filled with that that you need to be able to dominate the decisions that he's called you to dominate. That's God's will for your life. That's God's destiny. God wants you to accomplish and receive and and experience the fulfillment of what it is to hear his voice, to hear him calling you, to hear him speaking to you, to see him empowering you. And it will take you places that you've never been able to go before. Like I mentioned a moment ago, Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I said this in in the 9 o'clock service. Don't take this out of context, but drunk people tell the best stories. And I think it's no coincidence that being filled with the Holy Spirit is analogous to being drunk. In Acts chapter 2, the people who are filled with the Holy Ghost, they said, ah, those are drunk people. They don't pay them no attention. Because they live in a world that's inebriated and that's not affected and does not allow them to feel the sensations of what's around them, but they live in their own mind. They have their own mindset. You can't mess with them. Sometimes you can't even talk to them. If you want to talk to them about what you want to talk about, they're not going to pay any attention to you because they got their own focus. And and if you want to be a person who's able to walk through this life, come on, somebody, with the strength that you need to be able to make it through living in Hollywood and living in Los Angeles, being all that God's called you to be and not being distracted by the things around you, it's going to take being drunk off the Holy Ghost. And if you allow yourself to get filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll find yourself inebriated to the doubt and inebriated to the discouragement and inebriated to the people that would tell you that you can't be all that God's called you to be. And you won't pay them any attention because what's filling you is stronger. That's God's will for your life. That's God's will for your, for your destiny. And devotion comes as a result of that because when you're filled with something, that something leads you. That's why people who are filled with anger are led by anger. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a relative or a complete stranger, they're led by anger. And if you cross their path, you better hope that it's on a good day because they're led by that. But if you allow yourself to be filled with the Spirit of God, 
then you can be like Daniel said. And he said, those that know their God will be strong and they'll do exploits. That's what happens when you get to know God. We're not just religious fanatics that come to church all the time because we have nothing better to do. But we've discovered that there is a God who's designed us with purpose and destiny. And if we get connected to him, then that's the only way that we will ever be who we're called to be. Um, I, one of the things that I get to do back in Denver is I have the privilege of pastoring our Spanish congregation. And we have a Spanish congregation out there. In, in the city of Denver, and believe it or not, I speak fluent Spanish. Uh, some people may be like, you know, where is he from? I'm black. Um, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I have a friend of mine that, that grew up with me who's out here. He can, he can testify. Greg Orton, am I black? I'm black, you know? And uh, I'm black. And I grew up, I grew up black, and, and I'm still black. But something happened. Something happened, and uh, when I was a, a freshman, when I was a freshman in high school, I lived in South Carolina, and in South Carolina, come on, anybody from South Carolina? What? Shout out. My mom's from Greenville. Um, and so when I was living in South Carolina, um, the first semester of my freshman year, you take four classes. Second semester, you take a totally different set of classes. So first semester, I took Spanish one. Uh, I got a C because I wasn't that devoted, wasn't that disciplined. Spanish hadn't you know, done that much for me yet. I couldn't see the purpose. I couldn't see the, the, the vision behind it. Um, second semester, took Spanish two. Uh, because I was the incredibly disciplined person that I was, I got a D. Um, and it was just going downhill. It was just going down. You know, Mary J. Black, I'm going down. You know, just, it was just, it was, it was bad. And, and, and then we moved out to Colorado. My dad retired from the Air Force. And we moved to Denver, and my guidance counselor, my sophomore year, said, listen, I need you to, to take this again because you got to improve your GPA, and, and this is what's best for your long-term grades. And with that encouragement and with that word from my guidance counselor, I got an F. <laughs> okay? It, it just was not looking good. C, D, F. I'm like, God, I don't know what's going on, but like this is, cannot be a part of my future. And um, that summer, uh, we went to a, a, a camp in the mountains, and, and the spirit of God was there so strong. And I had one of those things that, that preachers talk about. I had an encounter with God. And I, I had an encounter with God, and I didn't know that it was possible for God to love people as much as I found out that he loved me. I didn't know that the love of God was like something that you can feel. Like it's something you can feel. Like, like some people may be crazy and, you know, you can, you can write off the crazy people because there are legitimate crazy people who need help. And we love them too. But, you know, they're, they're working through their process and their journey. But, but there's something about the love of God that you can actually feel. And it will fill every single void and every crevice in your heart and in your soul. And it will cause you to feel a satisfaction and a peace and a release and a relax that does not come from anything in this life. And that happened to me when I was 15 years of age. And it changed my life forever. It changed my life forever. And if you haven't had that experience, you can have it today. And I remember coming back to Grandview High School in Aurora, Colorado. And I came back my junior year, and I remember standing in the hallway outside of my third period Spanish class, and I was about to go in. And something just, something just came over me. The Bible says the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit was on Simeon. And so he, he was doing stuff that the Spirit of God was inspiring him to do. And I remember that the Spirit of God just, just came over me in this moment. And I guess that's how I, how I reflect on it now. In the moment, it, it just seemed just the natural thing to say. But I remember saying in Spanish, I remember saying, if I'm going to be in this class for five days a week for the entirety of this year, then I'm going to learn how to speak this language. I was like, where does that come from? What, what business do I have to speak in Spanish? But supernaturally, and that's the only way that I know how to say it, is that God began to give me a grace for that language. 
And I began to learn and I began to progress and I began to grow and, and, and my grades were much better that particular year. And it got so crazy that I remember entering a contest one time for Spanish oration and I be- did my, my, my entrance exam application thing for the, for the contest and they said, you know that this is not for native speakers. And I don't know where your parents are from. I was like, my mom's from South Carolina. My dad's from Texas. I don't know what you're talking about, but I am a Negro. Okay. <clears throat> but thankfully, I speak Spanish. And, 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 and God has given me that ability. Anybody speak Spanish in here? A couple people, como están? Dios les bendiga. Los amo, los quiero. Y es un placer estar aquí con ustedes en esta tarde. Porque Dios me ha bendecido con la habilidad de hablar este idioma. Y por eso les estoy hablando así. Viva México, señores. Amen. But that happened because the Spirit of God had a purpose with that language. And I'm going to tell you something. When I was a freshman, the very first time I took Spanish, my teacher was a Colombian guy. He was a Christian. He had just gotten here from Medellin, and, and he could barely speak English. But I'll never forget, he would play black gospel music in our, in our class. It was crazy. And... Um, <laughs> And I remember him saying to me, he said to me, before, before, the, before the, the turnaround, right, C, D, F. This is when I first started with C. It was going to get a lot worse before it got better. But he looked me in my eyes and he said, you're going to speak Spanish very well. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I will. Gracias. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and he said it a second time, but he said it with conviction. And this is the conviction I had seen preachers stand with at altar calls, and they would look people in their eye, and they would say, God has a plan for your life. I don't care what the devil's done. God is going to turn it around, and God's going to change your life. And he said that to a ninth grader in a, in a public high school. And I stand before you today with the same prophetic ability to speak in your life and I don't know your story I don't know your destiny I don't know specifically what God wants to do in your life but I can tell you with certainty and with the scripture behind me that if you allow the spirit of God to fill you he will put things in your in your life that will enable you to fulfill the destiny that he's called you to fulfill because that's the God that we serve so don't go in to 2018 hoping you can dominate your decisions. Go into 2018 knowing that you have the ability to dominate every decision that you need to make. And if you found yourself struggling in the past, realize that if the Spirit of God fills you, He'll lead you. And you'll be able to make every decision that you need to make. You won't find yourself giving into peer pressure. You won't find yourself succumbing to the temptations that you used to succumb to. You won't find yourself debilitated by whether or not people approve of you. But you'll be able to dominate and make the right decision anyway because God's spirit is on the inside of you. So the first thing you need to do is disrupt disappointment. Because if you believe God, disappointment has no place in your life. Because he only gives you desires that he intends to fulfill. The second thing you need to do is dominate your decisions because it's not your power doing it. But if you allow the spirit of God to fill you, He'll dominate your decisions, and you'll find yourself with a discipline that can only be explained by the goodness of God that has caused you to desire something that you did not desire before. And the third thing that God wants you to do in order for you to walk into that destiny of rising is to destroy doubt. You have to. You have to. You've got to. If you don't hear anything else I say this morning, you've got to destroy doubt. Because if you don't destroy doubt, doubt will destroy you. And, and I want to I tell you a story uh, about a guy in the Bible by the name of Thomas. And Thomas, all over the world, you may not know this uh, about him and his uh, fame in Christianity, but he's infamous for being the disciple of doubt. Because in one of his lowest moments... The doubt that he had, in many ways, defined who people saw him as. And that's how people view him in the scripture, looking from the outside in. So if you've ever found yourself in a moment of doubt, don't think that it actually has to be the definition of who you are. 
Because as human beings, we find ourselves in moments of doubt. And truth be told, the same moment of doubt that he found himself in, the other disciples also found themselves in. We just only hear his story and his commentary on the issue. But in John chapter 20, the Bible says that Jesus had risen from the dead, and, which is a crazy thing. Christians, we actually believe that our God has power over death, which is something that humanity would say is impossible to overcome. But for our God, we believe that there's nothing impossible for him. And so Jesus had risen from the dead. He's done the impossible. He's conquered what nobody said could be conquered. And, and just as Jesus would do, he walks in on the disciples and they're having breakfast and they're in a room and the doors are closed. And for dramatic effect, he comes right walking through the wall. Scares the living daylights out of everybody. And he's like, fear not. <laughs> and Peter's like, yeah, I bet you would say fear not. You come in here scaring all of us, you know. And, and he says, fear not. And so the disciples are so excited about the fact that they get to see the risen Christ. And a week later, the Bible says eight days later, eight days later, Thomas is with the disciples because he wasn't with them the first time. And in the meantime, the whole week long, and the disciples are like, you're not going to believe this. This was crazy. It was amazing. You should have been here. You know, Bartholomew dropped his, uh, his oatmeal all over the place because he saw Jesus walking in the door. You know, and, and, and Thomas is like, yeah, man, I believe it when I see it. I believe it when I see it. I believe it. When I can, when I can stick my finger through the hole in his hand, then I believe it. If I can stick my hand in his side, then I'll believe it. And since I probably won't be able to do that, I might not ever believe. And if you, if you have that kind of attitude of skepticism, please know that God loves you. And God is not scared of your skepticism. God is not scared of your unbelief. And matter of fact, God is willing to meet your challenge and say, just the demand that you're going to make of me, I want to fulfill it because I love you so much that I'm not going to leave you sitting on the outside without experiencing who I am. So, so fast forward a week from the first time Jesus comes back. <clears throat> Thomas is, is there with the disciples, and, and, and Jesus comes walking in. And he allows Thomas to stick his hand in his, his finger in his hand and his hand in his side. He says, Thomas, remember what you said? Here it is. And... And Thomas says, my God, my Lord. He was so shocked. He was so amazed by the love of God that he didn't care about what he was skeptical about anymore. And I'm not going to sit here and have a diatribe about atheism and this and that and, 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 and how the world came to be and all of these things and whether there was a Noah's Ark and all of those kinds of issues. But I believe if you discover the love of God, a lot of those questions that you have will become secondary. And you might find the answers that you're looking for, but what you will find is a love that will completely revolutionize your life. And so that's what Thomas discovered. And I mentioned a while back about having the desire to go to Vancouver as, as one of the destinations that I wanted to see. And um, my parents were in the Air Force and so we would move every three years. But I was born about two hours from here, Vandenberg Air Force Base, Santa Barbara County, California. And I've always wanted to see the place that I was born. <clears throat> Never been able to go back there and, and, and see it yet, but I, I've got plans to do that. And I know that this, this area, this region of the state of our country has been ravaged by wildfires. And you can see it flying in. The smoke is, is terrible. And... Um, you know, we mourn with, with those of you who have been directly affected by these fires. One of the first things I did was call some of my friends that live out here, and one of them lives in the city, and he's like, you know, the fires aren't close to us, but you can, you can smell the smoke everywhere. And, and one of my other friends who lives close to the valley, he was like, you know, it's about 20 minutes away from me, but the wind's blowing it in the opposite direction. But I find it interesting that, that this fire, the largest fire in California wildfire history, it's called the Thomas Fire. And metaphorically speaking, I believe that the same doubt that was destroying Thomas for that week, separating him from the God who rose from the dead for him, is the same kind of doubt 
that as a fire would seek to destroy the destiny and the future that God has for your life. It's, it's a fire that, that will consume your dreams. It'll consume your hope. It'll consume your optimism. And before you know it, your insides are dark because the way that you see the world is through a filter that says that what I really, really want, what I really believe that God has for me is not possible. And it's not even true. And God says, God says just as the, the Thomas fire literally in real time is almost 100% contained, I believe that if you decide to put your faith in Jesus like you've never put it in him before, that that fire of doubt will find itself completely put out by the water of God's word. If you let God's word just cover and just saturate that thing, you'll find yourself with so much faith that you'll get on people's nerves who don't believe God and just be like, oh my gosh, man, you just, you just believe everything's possible. You just, think, you just think the world is full of rose-colored glass views. And, and it's, it's not that you're unrealistic, but it's that you know that you serve a God who's greater than reality itself. So why would I doubt? Because that's how God wants you to look. And one of the things that, that I was thinking of as I was coming out here for New Year's Eve in Los Angeles and all of the things that go on in this region is that even though there were so many fires this year in this state, worst year of wildfires on record in the state of California, tonight, all around this city, there are going to be firework displays. There's going to be firework displays in Arena Del Rey. There's going to be firework displays at Universal Studios. There's going to be firework displays in Anaheim at Disneyland. Like, there's going to be fireworks going up all over the place. And that's a fire that's associated with joy. It's associated with celebration. It's associated with we made it to the end of 2017. We're going into 2018, and we're going to celebrate. Because the city officials know that there are two kinds of fires. There's a fire that will destroy you. There's a fire that will literally take your life. And there's a fire that rises that is a cause of joy. There's a fire that goes up in the air that causes people to look to it and say, look, look, look. And they cause their kids to look and they point to it. And they're excited about it. And I don't know if you remember the scriptures that we started with. But if we go back to Luke chapter 2, verse number 32, it says, He is a light to reveal God to the nations. And he is the glory of your people Israel. And it wasn't just talking about any old ordinary he. It was talking about Jesus, the son of the living God. And I remember him saying one of the many times that he was talking. He said, if I be lifted up. I will cause all men to come unto me. And one of the things that God wants you to do is he wants your life to be a life that people can look up to. Because you are just like your Savior in the sense that if you are lifted up before your friends and before your family, they will not just see you. They'll see the Jesus in you. And they'll realize there's no way that that person could have made it out of that situation. There's no, I know that. I grew up with them. I used to listen to them talk about people. I used, to, I used to help them do the stuff that they used to do. And there's no way that they could be rising in life like that. But you serve a God and you have the opportunity to serve a God who's risen from the dead. Not, not even death could hold him. He was destined to rise. And if you allow yourself to be connected to him, you have no choice but for your destiny to be to rise. That's the opportunity that we have. So we, we don't destroy doubt by saying, I'm not going to doubt, I'm not going to doubt, I'm not going to, I believe, I believe, I believe. That's not how you destroy doubt. Don't kill yourself. Okay, you destroy doubt by deciding to rise. And the way that you decide to rise is connecting yourself to the one who's already risen. God wants you to rise. God cares about this city. He cares about your friends. He cares about your family members. He cares about you. And he wants you to rise, not just for the narcissistic sake of having grandiose expectations for the next year. But he wants you to rise because he knows if you rise, just like those families in Anaheim tonight in Disney, they're going to be telling their kids, look, 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 over there, over there. And the people that you know, come back, look, 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 look at his life. 
oh my God, look, do you remember when he was talking about wanting to kill himself and he didn't want to be here and he thought that 2018 was going to be just as bad as 2017, so he might as well end it now? Remember that? Look, look, look. It's Jesus that makes a difference. Jesus is going to change everything for you. You can't afford to have low expectations. You know why? You know why the city officials allow fireworks even in the midst of such a dry climate and all the wildfires that are burning around us? It's because they know that fireworks go up. If you aim fireworks too low, they'll cause the very same destruction that everybody else is running from. You can't afford to have low expectations. If you, have, if you have low expectations, you're, you're, you're jeopardizing other people's opportunity to connect to the God that you serve. Don't you dare lower your expectations. Don't you dare let disappointment disrupt the destiny that God has for you. You have to disrupt disappointment by deciding to believe. You have to dominate your decisions because when you do that, you show people who you're filled with and it points them to him. I want you to stand up with, with me on your feet. Oh, God is good. God is good. He's called us to rise, y'all. We're destined to rise. If we hold on to him, there's nowhere to go but up. And I want to pray for people who would say that regardless of the circumstance or regardless of the reason that you would come down, that you would say, you know what? I want to rise in 2018. And not just for myself, but I want to rise because as people look at me, they're going to see the God in me. If that's you, come on, I want you to meet me at this altar. God's going to do something in you. Come on, let's celebrate him. We thank God. Because we, we, we have to live with that objective. Oftentimes, I would even go as far as to say that what causes us to fall is, is that narcissistic, inwardly focused intention of saying, I want to rise for just me. And when you say, I want to just rise for just me, usually it's because you haven't connected yourself to the purpose of rising so that other people can see Jesus. Because rising for just you is empty. You can rise for you and you can get to the top and look down and be like, this, this wasn't even worth it. Like, they got me all worked up about rising for myself and being in the spotlight and shining and being seen and all that. And there's nothing to it. But when you rise so that people can see Jesus in you, then it'll be said of you what was said of David, that he fulfilled his purpose in his generation. And there's nothing more satisfying than knowing that you came to the end of your days having fulfilled the purpose that God put on the inside of you. And God has a purpose for every single one. Come on, you can praise God for that. He has a purpose for every single one of you. There's not one person that God wants to leave out. We're going to pray. And we're going to rise up. I feel an like Andrew Day anointing. For those of you who know that song. We're going we're gonna to rise because God wants us to rise. God, I thank you for your spirit that's in this place. I thank you, God, that your spirit causes people to rise. God, that wherever your spirit goes, there's resurrection. God, so I, I speak to dead dreams and I say rise in Jesus' name. I speak to disappointment that's been tolerated and I say be removed in Jesus' name because we believe in a God that removes disappointment. God, I thank you, Lord God, for the people who felt like they've been dominated by decisions that they can't control. People who feel like they're dominated by choices, God, that they can't overcome. I thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who fills them with the power to be able to overcome. And I thank you, Lord God, that last but not least, God, doubt is destroyed in this place. Doubt is destroyed in this place. And I thank you, God, that it's not just destroyed in this place, but it's destroyed in the lives of the people that are connected to these people sitting at this altar. God, because they're going to leave this place, and their life is going to rise like never before. And when their life rises, people are going to look at them and say, oh, my goodness, look at what God has done. God, so I thank you, Holy Spirit, 
God, as we go into this new season, God, as we come back here tonight, God, to get ready to hear a word, to go into this new season with strength and power. God, I thank you that you start us off by knowing that we are called to rise. We're called to rise. And this isn't just for a couple people. This is for everybody. Maybe you didn't even have the boldness or the, or the feeling or the desire at the moment to come down to this altar. But I believe God is going to meet you right where you are. And he's going to cause you to rise because that's who his son is. That's what Jesus did. He rose. Jesus can't stay down. And anybody who's connected to Jesus is destined to rise. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, my friend, I pray that that message blessed your life. It blessed me for sure. I want to also encourage you to pick up wholeness, winning in life from the inside out. This book is going to change your life. God bless you. I'll see you next time.